Hello, this is Jörg Lissmann once again and I'm doing another reading today of Rulers of Evil, chapter 17 we have already arrived and it gets more interesting chapter by chapter, I can tell you. This chapter 17 now is called A Timely Grand Tour. Among the many British visitors to Rome during Clement XIV's sweetening toward England in the early 1770s was a young member of an ancient ruling family of Dorset <coughs> and Somerset county counties named Charles Philip Storton. Charles Philip was nephew to the Dukes of Norfolk. We remember the Norfolks, Thomas and Edward Howard, for their significant contributions to America in the American independence. Thomas, originator of colonial Freemasonry, Edward, coupler of Lord Bute, to the future George III. Arriving in Rome with Charles Philip was his professor at the Jesuit College in the medieval Flemish, which is now Belgian, city of Bruges, John Carroll. The pair were enjoying a grand tour of Europe, which had begun in the summer of 1771. From Bruges they had proceeded by carriage down through Alsace-Lorraine to Strasbourg, across the Rhine to Baden-Baden, which is in Germany, then upstream to Karlsruhe, Bruchal, Heidelberg, Mannheim, Worms and Mainz, all German cities, I mind you, and all very Catholic. From Mainz they made a curious detour over to Trier, back to Mannheim through Swabia to Augsburg, then to Munich, well... Innsbruck, across the Italian border to Trent, along the Adige River to Roveredo, Verona, Mantua, Modena and Bologna. They reached Rome in the autumn of 1772. In Rome, Lorenzo Ricci appointed Carroll to the position of Prefect of the Sodality. This title designates, according to the New Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, a chief organizer of laymen for the promotion of some form of social action. Unquote. For the promotion of what social action, I wonder, might Ritchie have ordained Carroll to organize, if not the American Revolution? While John was in Rome with Lorenzo Ritchie, his cousin Charles Carroll, now in his mid thirties, pulled off a clever media ruse in Maryland. It won him tremendous popularity and established him as an important civic leader. In January of 1773, a letter in the Maryland Gazette attacked the administration of Maryland Governor Robert Edens. The letter was signed, quote-unquote, First Citizen. And as you probably remember when following our broadcasts on Hour of the Truth, where we went into the Carroll family extensively, you will remember that Charles Carroll was called the first citizen. In a subsequent gazette, the attack was demolished by the eloquent, eloquent arguments of a quote-unquote second citizen. But in February, first citizen demolished second citizen. As the duel continued on into the summer, first citizen was revealed to be Charles Carroll, whereup second citizen nastily slandered Carroll putting him down as a disfranchised Catholic. Suddenly now, Carroll was an underdog, just like his fellow Americans in relation to the British crown. Although Charles was a super-rich lawyer, landowner, educated at the best Jesuit colleges in Europe, the people lavished him with sympathy. He despised, quote-unquote, second citizen for his bigotry. Maryland and America now had a new hero, a preeminent uh, pre champion of religious liberties. <laughs> yeah, religious liberty. A Roman Catholic first citizen advocating a new political order. Loathsome second, second citizen made the status quo seem distasteful and undesirable, which, of course, was his assignment in the ruse. Second citizen turned out to be the acknowledged head of the American bar a Mr. Dulaney. Meanwhile, with the coming of spring, Carol and Stoughton left Rome for Florence, Genova, Lyon, Paris, Liège, back in Belgium, arriving back in Bruges, Belgium, or Flanders at that time, just a few weeks before Ganganelli, Clement XIV, disestablished the Jesuits. 
Carroll kept a journal of their tour, partly a study guide for Charles Philip, partly a travelogue. It's a fragmentary and circumspect document, as one historian jingly put, uh, put it. Here and there one finds snatches of informal political opinion. Although Carroll's opinions are interesting, <clears throat> it's his circumspection that intrigues us most. It's what his journal doesn't say. Traveling with a student appears ordinary enough, but Charles Philip Stoughton was no ordinary collegian. He was a student of casuistry, equivocation and Bellarminian liberation theology, taught by the professionals sworn to expand Roman Catholicism and extirpate Protestantism. He had been indoctrinated to obedience through the spiritual exercises was a member of England's premier Catholic and Masonic family, and was about the age of Alexander Hamilton, who by then was already turning out anonymous revolutionary pamphlets at King's College in New York. Nor were Carroll or Anstorton merely sight-seeing. They were up to something big, something very big indeed. Carroll's journal alludes to meetings with high-ranking officials in church and state, but gives no specific names. Writing to an English Jesuit colleague, he confided, quote, I keep a close incognito during this time, unquote. And we spoke about his incognito already at the end of chapter 16, as you probably might remember. Despite Carroll's circumspection, his in, uh, it in Itinerary, sorry, his itinerary reveals certain clues. Consider that odd detour to Trier from the route between Mainz and Mannheim. Trier is more than 200 kilometers out of the way, quite a long day's journey, <laughs> surely at that time. What might warrant such a deviation? There appeared in 1763 a highly controversial book by an obviously pseudonymous person, Justinius Febronius. The pseudonym belonged to Bishop Nikolaus von Hontheim, Chancellor of the University of Trier. In John Carroll's day, Trier University had been run by Jesuits for more than a century. The book, of which there is apparently no published English translation out of its original Latin, is entitled On the State of Church and, Legit and the Legitimate Power of the Roman Pontiff. The gist of State of the Church suggests why Carroll had to visit Trier. Febronianism, the philosophy of von Hontheim's book, contains the formula for administering Protestant America as a Bellarminian commonwealth. Febronianism called for decentralizing the Roman Catholic Church into independent national churches, modeled on the Church of England. Because they are ruled directly by kings and princes, these churches are more correctly called states. The Pope may be successor to Peter, Prince of the Apostles, but under Febronianism he has no legal jurisdiction. He is merely a principle of unity, a spiritual unifier obligated to abide by the decrees of general councils under the leadership of bishops, and their properly enlightened laymen. Crucial to Febronianism's application is, quote, thorough popular education, unquote. Once laymen, bishops and councils are, quote, properly enlightened, unquote, they will be empowered to resist any attempts of the papacy to exert monarchical control over the church. Febronius emphasized that his system would succeed only in a milieu of popular enlightenment. His context presumes an enlightenment wherein the public is indoctrinated with Jesuit ratio studiorums, full humanist diet, of course. It cannot operate where scripture reigns supreme. Once the milieu's understanding, its, mental, its mentality, has been shaped by the superior general of the Society of Jesus. 
it will respond with unquestioning obedience to the will of the man whose fundamental duty is the expansion of Roman Catholicism and the extirpation of Protestantism. Thus will unfold a perfect secular political state within the Roman Catholic Church, an autocracy ruled by a monarch invisible to all but the few who, by the grace of God, cannot be deceived. Febrionanism was the secret formula for returning the non-Catholic world to the bosom of the Church. To mask this fact, the Vatican dramatically condemned the book. The Jesuit Clement XIII had banned it from colleges and universities. In a rather quaint example of academic quote-unquote blown cover as cover, we discussed that also in chapter 16, Bishop von Hontheim, whom few realized was Febronius, even banned it from its own classes at the university. That is blown cover as cover. On the state of the church is arguably Lorenzo Ricci's American Manifesto, the social blueprint for how the general intended to realize Bellarminian liberation in the Protestant monarchy. The full title page of the first edition copy of the book says it all. Quote, On the state of the church and the legitimate power of the Roman pontiff, a singular book on the popery ordered reunification with dissidents in the Christian religion. Unquote. Here one beholds a description of the momentous social change that the American Revolution would indeed produce neither monarchical overthrow, nor democracy, nor republicanism, but a, quote, properly ordered reunification with dissidents in the Christian religion, unquote. That is, the reunification of Roman Catholics with Protestants under a secularized religion whose values, long on humanism, short on scripture, are taught through public schools following the Jesuit ratio studiorum. Reunification means that Protestantism has been absorbed into Rome. This, in the eyes of the Black Papacy, to the Sun Tzuan mind and to common sense, equals the practical extirpation of Protestantism. And I just want to remind the listener to think about what happened in Vatican II with the ecumenic, ecumenical movement. This is an early sign of the ecumenical movement, already in the 1800s. Although Bishop von Hontheim lived in Trier, he was Archbishop of Mainz. His jurisdiction extended to the Mainz Principality of Hesse-Hanover. Von Hontheim was thus the spiritual counterpart of the ruler of Hesse-Hanover, Frederick II, not to be confused with the King of Prussia, Frederick the Great, who was also a Frederick II. Frederick II of Hesse was married to the aunt of the King of England, which made him George III's uncle. Born a Protestant, Frederick subscribed to the Rosicrucian style of Freemasonry. Although Jesuits converted him to Roman Catholicism, he nevertheless remained a Rosicrucian secretly active. Frederick von Hesse was one of Europe's richest rulers. Much of his business was handled by his son, Prince William, also a Rosicrucian Freemason. William's, <coughs> excuse me. William's specialty was facilitating war. He drafted able-bodied male Hessians, outfitted and trained them for battle, and then sold them to his English cousin George, who used them to fight alongside his own redcoats. Every time a Hessian was killed, William received a reparation in the form of extra compensation. As casualties mounted, so did his profits, which he loaned out at interest. Just have to intervene here a second and remind you of the reading Tom Fress does at this moment of the book The Global Vatican. And he emphasizes very much in his reading that the Church at peace does not move forward with their agenda. The Church is only valuable when there is war. And here you can see how that is and what the profit of war does mean to the Church. 
Now, in September 1769, Prince William appointed Meyer Amschel Rothschild of nearby Frankfurt to transact some of his financial affairs in the capacity of Crown Agent. Crown Agent. Listen very carefully now when we deal with the Rothschilds. Here you will now experience and get the knowledge of what the Rothschilds really are. They don't run the world, but you will see that in a second. This is really, really great information. Aware that the Rothschilds are an important Jewish family, I looked them up in the Encyclopedia Judaica and discovered that they bear the title, quote-unquote, Guardians of the Vatican Treasury. The Vatican Treasury, of course, holds the imperial wealth of Rome, Imperial wealth grows in proportion to its victories in war, as the Jesuit empowerment Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae implies the church at war is more necessary than the church at peace. Well, just confirming what I just told you about Tom Fress's reading of the Global Vatican, where he absolutely makes that point also. And there you can see that Tom, with his analysis in the Global Vatican, is absolutely at point with what Tupper Saucy writes in his book, Rulers of Evil. This is why this book, Rulers of Evil, is so important to know and to understand and to see through the so-called Jewish deception. But I continue reading now. <coughs> According to H. Russell Robinson's illustrated Armor of Imperial Rome, Caesarian soldiers protected themselves in battle with shields painted red. Since the soldiery is the state's most valuable resource, the Council of Trent admitted this in preferring the Jesuits to all other religious orders, it is easy to understand why the red shield was identified with the very life of the Church. Hence, the appropriateness of the name Rothschild, German for Red Shield, Rothschild. The appointment of Rothschild gave the Black Papacy absolute financial privacy and secrecy. Who would ever search a family of Orthodox Jews for the key to the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church? I believe this appointment explains why the House of Rothschild is famous for helping nations go to war. It is just fascinating that as Maya Rothschild's sons grew into the family business, the firm took on the title, now listen very closely, Maya, Amschel, Rothschild und Söhne, which gives us the notarikon M A R. S. Maya M. Amsche A. Or A. Rothschild R. Und Söhne S. And Sons. Maya Amsche Rothschild and Sons. M. A. R. S. Mars. Isn't Mars the Roman god of war whose heavenly manifestation is the red planet? There is powerful Kabbalah here, and there's hardly an acre of inhabitable earth that hasn't been affected by it in some way. Now, I hope that you paid attention to me reading these last paragraph <coughs> that I just read from chapter 17. Mars, the god of war of the Romans, the red planet, the soldiery as using the red shields to defend themselves when they went out for Rome to war. Do you see all the connection in all this stuff? Do you really think the Jews made this up? This is as Roman as can be. And the Rothschilds are nothing else than so-called Hofjuden or court Jews. And they are all at that time, Maya Amsha Rothschild was, and you can find pictures with that, Knights of Malta, or any other Roman knighthood they participated in. So they just sell out their quote-unquote Jewish heritage 
to the Roman pontiff and acting as the guardians of the Vatican treasure. Now, who do you think can make use of the money of the Vatican treasure? The guardian or the owner? Who is the owner of all that money? Of course the Rothschilds are not poor. I'm not saying that. They are a very rich family. But on the other hand, they are only the administrators of the Vatican treasure. So, the money first and for all comes from the Vatican and not from the Rothschilds themselves. And they are deeply involved in banking and because we've learned already before and otherwise we will probably read this after and you can also check that on Tom's reading on the Global Vatican. They use that money from the Roman Catholic Church for insider trading all these years. That's why a normal person can never get really rich when going to the stock market because then so-called insider trading is forbidden. <laughs> yeah, it's just reserved for the people on the top to know that. And when you listen to Tom Fress reading that, it's about a sum that was paid by the Italians to, I, I think that was with the, uh, with the signing of the Lateran Treaty in 1929, so a little ahead in the future of what we are reading here. Uh, when the Lateran Treaty was signed, Mussolini paid, um, as I remember correctly, 750 million lira, which is about a hundred million dollars at that time, to the Vatican for reparations for taking away the civil power of the Pope in the past. And they used that with uh, insider trading from that time on to amount a sum that is probably even unimaginable. They control all the stock markets in the world. And then you see also that in nowadays all the big companies, like for example Monsanto, which will take over the whole food production of the whole world, was founded by a Knight of Malta. And not only Monsanto, but also soldieries like today's XE that you probably know still as Blackwater. They are all night controlled, papal night controlled, most of the time Knights of Malta. And here, with what I just read and told you about the Rothschild family, you can see where the Roman Catholic Church and their affiliates laid the basis for that future success. This chapter 17 is without any doubt with the content of the knowledge of the Rothschild family, as stated here by Tapper Saucy, one of the, if not the most important chapter of the book. To understand the deception, people are led to believe today, in our days. Okay, I will continue reading now, still in chapter 17. It may never be known if John Carroll and Charles Philip Storton paid a call on the offices of Meyer Rothschild during their grand tour. Carroll was not permitted to keep a record, and the Rothschild name is synonymous with secrecy. But a call keeping a quote-unquote close incognito at the house of Rothschild would not be inconsistent with outcome. The newly designed prefect of the Sodality, chief organizer of laymen for social action, would have a legitimate need to talk finances with the church's most secret trustee. As things were developing, General Ritchie needed an American financial crisis to provoke the colonists into resolving the utter necessities of war. And this, let me remind you, is just a predecessor of what happened with World War I. Without the founding of the Federal Reserve Bank in 1913 by the quote-unquote grace of President Wilson at that time, the Jesuits would not have been possible to 
get the money to raise the money for the world war. And this is exactly the same thing quoted here now by Tupper Saucy, that General Ritchie needed an American financial crisis to provoke the colonists into resolving the utter necessity of war. In other words, this is just the same thing they did almost 230 years later on with the starting of World War I, founding the Federal Reserve. And before founding the Federal Reserve, remind you, to another upload I did, uh, you can look it up, it's in the playlist behind the door, the first part of that, there are still 53 parts to come, the first part of that deals with the sinking of the Titanic and the Jesuits' role in sinking the Titanic and the reason behind it. So I'm going to let you watch the video and not going to say it all here in this broadcast right now. But let, remind, let me remind you of one fact. There's nothing new under the sun. History only repeats itself over and over and over again. And that is why the Jesuit order who are the masters of the so-called education system that we have today, don't want you to know history. Because when you know history, you can see what's going on in the world right now. And that would take away their secrecy, and that would take away their cover. And they don't want that. They make sure that you don't know history, and by that are oblivious to the things happening in our days. Carroll's journal reflects that he and Storton did enter the Frankfurt Mines area, which is Rothschild country, in early spring 1772. If we suppose they talked financial crisis with the Rothschilds, the outcome of their talks actually did occur several months later. During July 1772, in fact, the British banking system underwent a severe credit reduction. This consequently threw American merchants into an extreme financial distress that did not end until the Revolutionary War itself produced a business boom in 1776. Rothschild, with his access to Hesse Hanover's vast wealth, and conceivably that of the Jesuits as well, had power to effect a credit reduction in British banking. And Rothschild's profiting from the Revolutionary War is well known. If, during the spring of 1772, the circumspect young Jesuit professor conveyed to the powerful young Jewish banker Lorenzo Ricci's need for a financial disturbance in England and America, didn't John Carroll admirably save, serve his superior general? his church and his country? And didn't Rothschild do his client likewise? Even as Carroll and Stoughton were networking, according to my surmise, with Ritchie and the bankers of war, Emiot's son too was published. Carroll's circumspection bars us ever from knowing whether he and Stoughton came, <coughs> came upon a copy and read it. Did Rothschild know the book? Even if they knew it well, the experience could not possibly have been for them the adventure in irony it is for us now. We open the thirteen articles and hear the gentle voice of, of the man in charge of the papacy's most important business, the man who decided everything, who was in the process of gaining advantage from dangerous and critical circumstances whose intentions were unguessable, whose decisions were shaping both his own army and the armies of his English-speaking Protestant enemies, the man who through cleverness and ruse had already secured the obedience of his enemies in London and Boston and Paris and Philadelphia, although they believed him and his army to be far away and slumped in rest from sustained losses, the man who would win the most important war in modern times without giving battle or drawing a sword, who uniquely knew the day, the hour, the moment of battleless, swordless combat. Lorenzo Ricci's voice, 
whispers to us across the centuries between the lines and passages such as these. Quote, A state's most important business is its army. It's the general who decides everything. If he is clever, he will gain an advantage from even the most dangerous and critical circumstances. He will know how to shape at will not only the army he is commanding, but also that of his enemies. Try to be victorious without giving battle. Without giving battle, without spilling a drop of blood, without even drawing a sword, the clever general succeeds in capturing cities. Without setting foot in a foreign kingdom, he finds the means to conquer them. He acts in such a way that those who are inferior to him can never guess his intentions. He has them change location, even taking them to rather difficult places where they must work and suffer. Do not disdain the use of artifice. Begin by learning everything there is to know about your enemies. Now exactly what relationships they have, their reciprocal liaisons and interests. Do not spare large amounts of money. Have spies everywhere. Be informed of everything. Overlook nothing to corrupt that. <coughs> Sorry. Overlook nothing to corrupt what is best on the enemy's side. Offers, presents, caresses. Let nothing be omitted. Maintain secret liaisons with those amongst the enemy who are the most depraved. Use them for your own ends, along with other depraved individuals. Cross through their government, sowing dissension amongst their chiefs. Ceaselessly give them false alarms and bad advice. Engage the governors of their provinces in your interests. That is approximately what you must do, if you wish to fool them by cleverness and ruse. When a clever general goes into action, the enemy is already defeated. When he fights, he only must do more than his entire army, not through the strength of his arm, but through his prudence, his manner of commanding, and above all his ruses. The great secret of solving all problems consists in the art of knowing how to create division when necessary. What is far must be brought near. Advantage must be drawn even from losses. And showness must be turned into diligence. You must be near when the enemy believes you to be far. Have a real advantage when the enemy believes you have sustained some losses. Be occupied by useful work when he believes you are slumped in rest. And use all sorts of diligence when he only perceives you to be moving slowly. Thus, by throwing him off track, you will lull him into sleep in order to attack him when he expects it the least and without him having the time to prepare for it. As it is essential for you to be completely familiar with the place where you must fight, it is no less important for you to know the day, the hour, even the moment of combat. That is a calculation which you must not neglect. You, therefore, who are at the end, <coughs> who are at the head of an army, must overlook nothing to render yourself worthy of the position you hold. Throw your gaze upon the measurements and quantities and the measurements and, uh, of dimensions. Remember the rules of calculus. Consider the effects of balance. Examine what victory really is. Think about all of this deeply and you will have everything you need in order to never be defeated by your enemies. They who possess the true art of governing troops um, well are those who have known and who know how to make their power formidable. 
who have acquired unlimited authority, who are not brought low by an event no matter how vexing, who do nothing with precipita precipitation, who conduct themselves as calmly when they are surprised as they do when their actions have been planned long in advance, and who always act in everything they do with that promptness, which is in fact the fruit of cleverness combined with great experience. The strength of this sort of warrior is like that of those great bows which can only be stretched with the help of some machine. Their authority has the effect of those terrible weapons which are shot from bows which are thus stretched. Everything succumbs to their blows. Everything is laid low. If you do exactly as I have indicated, success will accompany all your steps. Everywhere you will be a conqueror. You will spare the lives of your soldiers. You will affirm your country in its former possessions and procure new ones. You will, argue, uh, you will augment the splendor and glory of the state, and the prince as well as his subjects will be indebted to you for the sweet tranquillity in which they will henceforth live their lives. What objects can be more worthy of your attention and all your efforts? Unquote. Charles, <coughs> Charles Philip Storton and John Carroll departed Rome for Flanders in March 1773. The journey took them four months. They passed through Florence, Genoa, Lyon and Paris, arriving at Liège in early July. John returned Charles Philip to his father, Lord Sturton, and proceeded alone to the Jesuit College at Bruges. Meanwhile in London, during the months of April, the British East India Company presented the King's friends a scheme which, if measured by the way it would anger American merchants and point them inexorably toward rebellion, could only have sprung from the San Juan intellect of Lorenzo Ricci. Quote, I demand the art of making enemies move as one wishes. Unquote. That scheme, a plan to glut New England with cheap tea, is the subject of our next chapter. That will be chapter 18 of Rulers of Evil, and that chapter is called a stimulating effects of tea. Well, the stimulating effects of tea. We are not talking about teaine or caffeine that is in the coffee, but we are talking about this treason they put on the American people that because of a few pence of taxes on tea, the Americans in the colonies were led into the civil uh, into the war of independence and as uh, as Tapasosi said this will be the part of the next chapter i want to leave this uh, at this right now because this chapter 17 was so so important and i think that you have to do maybe reading it twice or three times i already read it partially in parts a few times, and especially the part on the Rothschilds. Understand that the Rothschilds are just front men. They are just Hofjuden, court Jews, using their Roman Catholic papal knighthood connections to act according to the bidding of the Pope or the Black Pope. Because we all know that in the times that we live in right now, the White Pope is only a puppet. He was a puppet from 1814 on, and I guess we will see that later on in the reading of Rulers of Evil, with the re-establishing of the Jesuits after they have been banned by a papal bull in 1773 by Pope Clement XIII, which we will come to later in this book, Rulers of Evil. 
but I urge you to read again chapter 17 and do your own research. I know personally from Tom Fress that he looked it up personally on the online Encyclopedia Judaica and found that quote that is still possible to find it today that the Rothschilds are merely the guardians of the papal or Vatican treasury. Look it up for yourselves and I will probably do that also. But if not believing Tapper Saucy, I know I can believe my brother in Christ Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Now let this last reading sink in a little bit and next time we will continue reading Rulers of Evil chapter 18 The Stimulating Effects of Tea and we will come ever closer to the role the Roman Catholic Church and especially the soldiery of the Roman Catholic Church the Ecclesiae Militante the Society of Jesus the role they played in founding the nation of the United States of America. Combine this with our shows on Hour of the Truce and the booklet Walt Stickel put together, the, Jesu uh, the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy, based on the book from Ronald Cook of 1985, and the booklet that Walt made of it. It's for the moment 136 pages big. And you can download that as PDF from the Internet. Now, get the information as long as it is still available on the net. So I thank you very much for listening to my reading of Rulers of Evil. I hope you enjoyed it. And I will continue in not so far the future with reading Chapter 18. Until then, do your own research. God bless you, and bye-bye.